Welcome this morning. Um, hope you're all doing well. Uh, let's begin by doing an inner exercise. And I've sort of done this one before. Uh, this is sort of partially Gurdjieffian, um, partially my own, uh, trying to help people become aware of the difference between feeling and sensing. Uh, to be aware of the difference between feeling, which is blood-borne, which is a different quality of perception, as opposed to sensing, which is in our body, it's part of our organic physical awareness, is an important step uh, within these teachings, learning to differentiate between feeling and sensing. Um. Now, just in our mind, let's just... Uh, recognize that we are doing this work for ourselves, that we are doing this work for this planet, and that we are doing this work uh, for humanity. Actually, I said that wrong. It should be for ourselves, for humanity, and uh, for this planet. Uh, because ourselves, you know, we're, we're, we're working, you know, towards ourselves and towards the development of the real I uh, in the level of world 12, which is the realm of the real I. In world 24, the planetary realm, this is the realm where we share human essence, where we are connected uh, uh, in a very real way with other people. And then in world 48, the planet, uh, the planetary realm, the, or not the planetary realm, the earthly realm. Uh, you know, our body is composed of earth. It's composed of the minerals and elements of the earth. So uh, this is also important in terms of understanding esoteric psychology, to understand that we live on many different levels at the same time. So when we do this work, we're working along these three lines, for ourselves, for this planet, or for ourselves, for humanity, and for this planet. Okay. So I would like you to just begin by becoming aware of your body. Just do your best to sense your physical body. Perhaps sense the effect of gravity on your body, how gravity pulls your body down. To sense those pressure points beneath you, where your body connects with what is below you, perhaps under your sit sitting bones or under your thighs or under the bottom of your feet or even under your arms. Really do your best to become aware of the effect of gravity on your body. Try to also then become aware of the effect of balance, how your head is balancing on your neck, which is balancing on your shoulders, which is balancing on your uh, spine and rib cage and sternum, and which is balancing on your pelvic bones. Uh, become aware of the temperature, not only of the air surrounding you, but also inside yourself. Uh, we generally notice our own body's temperature when we have a fever or we've been doing something that makes us feel too hot, or we feel too cold, but our body always has its own internal temperature, which is, I think it's, a, I, I don't know what it is in Celsius. Um, our normal cell, uh, Fahrenheit temperature is 96.5, but our body, you know, the skin and everything is about 92 degrees, so it's a few degrees lower than our internal temperature. Uh, another thing we can become aware of is the atmospheric pressure around our body. This is more noticeable if we live in mountainous regions and go up and down mountains, but it's also noticeable to a degree uh, with weather patterns. Um, the barometric pressure lowers when you know it begins to rain and moisture comes in the air. So when storms and rainstorms uh, come, the atmospheric pressure around us begins to lower. And this is why some people claim that they can uh, be aware of a storm coming in. Uh, usually they say it's like in a knee joint or an elbow joint. 
but it's because they are perceptive and aware of this change in atmospheric pressure. And then do your best to try to become aware of the inside of your body. Become aware of the inside of your mouth, your tongue, your throat. Try to become aware of your esophagus down from your throat to your stomach. Try to become aware of the inside of your stomach, your abdomen. Um, we can become aware of our bladder, our colon. Now, Mr. Gurdjieff says uh, that said that we shouldn't pay too much attention to the inside of our body, particularly internal organs, because just by bringing the energy of attention, by bringing this higher energy into our bodies, we can disrupt the functioning of certain parts of our body. I knew one person who claimed that they had done a lot of meditation on their liver and they had developed the ability to sense their liver. But they had been a, a, a raging alcoholic for many years of their life before they stopped. And I think what they were trying to do was to bring a degree of healing to their liver. But Mr. Gurdjieff said if we focus internally uh, on specific organs by bringing this energy of attention, this higher energy, this energy of hydrogen 24 as opposed to the normal physical energy of hydrogen 48, we can change the tempo of these internal organs. And we are this massive clockwork like machine. And if we make an adjustment in one area, it will filter over and affect all of the other areas. So he said it's best to leave this specific awareness of these internal organs alone. And it's also why he said we shouldn't really engage in any real breathing practices without having a really, really good guide. Because when we change our breathing, we also change the mechanisms in our body. And just making a small change in one area will have an effect on the other areas. But we can just generally become aware of our internal sensations. We can just in general become aware of that internal awareness we have of our body. And then become aware of the surface of our body. Become aware of the touch of clothing the air that touches our face, perhaps if we have any kind of jewelry on our body or the hair on our head, or anything that we can perceive on the surface of our body. And the phrase that Mr. Gurdjieff used was the sensation of self, to develop this awareness, this sensation of self. And I further define it as, you know, an organic or, or a, a, a united or whole awareness of our organic self. Because the word organic is a very important word for Mr. Gurdjieff. And whenever he uses it, he uses it in a very specific context. So if you read any quotes where he quotes the word organic, or you read it in Beelzebub Tales, it means the self in world 48, our physical body our dimension in that realm. So become aware of your organic self. Become aware of your body. Become aware of the effect of gravity on your body, the internal sense of balance. Become aware of the atmospheric pressure of the air around your body. Become aware of your temperature in your body and the temperature of the atmosphere surrounding you. Become aware of, you know, within the viscera, within the sort of center part and the lungs. We can also be aware of inside our lungs. Try to just become aware generally in a very non-specific way of the inside of the body. And then become aware of our skin and the sensory nerve nodes on the outside of our body, the touch of clothing, the air, the hair on our face. Um, all of the exercises with self-sensing are really designed to develop this awareness, this sensation of self. 
the awareness of our body as one organic whole, the awareness of our body from the bottom of our feet to the top of our head. And so all of the exercises, the preliminary exercises, are really supposed to help us to build up to this muscle. This muscle or the sensation of self, this ability to strengthen it. However, it's also important specifically to become aware of our hands and feet. Uh, Mr. Gurdjieff said it is through our hands and feet that we receive influences. So if you've ever taken a yoga class and you're lying on your back in the Shadash, I forget how they pronounce it, but Shiva, they tell you to keep your palms open upwards to receive energy. Or if you're sitting in the lotus position, they'll tell you to keep your palms open upwards to receive energy. But we not only receive energy through our hands, we also receive energy through our feet. And this is also why it's important to become aware of the bones in our hands and feet. So let's just bring our attention and start with our right hand and just become aware of the three bones in our right hand. There's the, the first bone, the second bone, and the third bone is actually in the palm. So the, the, the finger bone goes right down to the cluster of bones in the center of the hand. So try to become aware of all three bones in your thumb, then all three bones in your right index finger, your right middle finger, your right fourth finger, your right baby finger. And then let's move down to our left foot. And again, there are three bones in the, the, the left toe that they, the third one goes right into the foot. So become aware of your left baby toe, your left fourth toe, your left middle toe, your left second toe, your left big toe. Then moving over to your right foot your right big toe, your right second toe, your right middle toe, your right fourth toe, your right baby toe. And then moving to your left hand, become aware of your left baby finger, your left fourth finger, your left middle finger, your left index finger, and your left thumb. And try to be aware of all of these digits at once. The fingers of your right hand, your left foot, your right foot, and your left hand. Try to become aware of these, your hands, your feet. Just try to do your best to develop this awareness of your hands and feet. And I think it's very ingenious how Mr. Gurdjieff gave an exercise to hold three fingers up and with one finger to use the head brain, to be aware of it with the head brain, to sense another finger and to feel another finger. And this exercise is found in Life is Real Only Then When I Am. It's actually a very, very advanced exercise to be able to place thought, the intellectual part of our brain, that intellectual awareness into one finger, the sensory awareness into another finger, and feeling into another finger. Now, I would like you to just become aware of your whole body as one organic whole. Try to sense your whole body. Try to sense the effect of gravity on your body, the touch of clothing on your skin, the air that touches your face. Try to be aware of your feet, your lower legs, knees, upper legs, 
hips and hands, uh, your lower abdomen, uh, lower arms, uh, your midriff, middle back, your elbows, your chest, uh, upper arms, upper back, your shoulders, your throat, your head. Try to develop this sensation of self, this awareness of self. And then let's become aware of our breathing, focusing on our breathing and the sensation of air as it flows in through our nose, nasal cavity, back of mouth, throat, vocal cords, down into our lungs and back out again. Really trace this flow of air as a sensation from your nostrils right down to your lungs and back out again. And then become aware of the sensation of the movement of the muscles involved, the sensation of your diaphragm expanding and contracting that parachute shaped muscle immediately under the lungs that expands down into the diaphragmic cavity and then contracts back up. And it acts like bellows and it pulls our lungs open, which pulls the air in. And as it contracts back up, it squeezes our lungs shut and pushes the air out. And the diaphragm is also connected to muscles in the abdomen, as well as the intercostal muscles between the ribs. So become aware of the sensation of the movement of these muscles. The diaphragm, abdomen, the muscles between the ribs. And in true Gurdjieffian fashion, try to build up a bigger picture. Try to become aware of the sensation of air as it flows in and out the movement of your diaphragm, abdomen, the muscles between the ribs, aware of your body, breathing. Try to become aware of your entire body breathing, the sensory awareness of your body, the specific sensation of air flowing in, the movement of muscles, while aware of your body, from the bottom of your feet to the top of your head. This is actually the way the Buddha taught mindfulness. He said in the Great Discourse on Mindfulness to first become aware of the air that flows in and out your nostrils, and then to become aware of the air that flows in and out from your nostrils to your lungs, and then to become aware of your whole body breathing. Pay attention to your breath. Pay attention to the sensation of air as it flows in and out, the movement of muscles. Become aware of your whole body breathing. Now, as we breathe in, we feed our body. And as we breathe out, we cleanse our body. And scientists have actually determined that 70 Seven zero seventy percent of our waste products are eliminated through our out breath. So we get rid of the carbon dioxide and noxious gases that build up in our system. So focusing on the out breath is as important as focusing on the in breath. Aware that as we breathe in, we are feeding our body, and as we breathe out, we are cleansing our body. And during one breathing exercise, Mr. Gurdjieff had his students imagine that as they breathed out, they were breathing out what I describe as a gray, foggy waste. He said to imagine it almost like breathing out the smoke of a cigarette, that grayish quality. So we are detoxifying our body as we breathe out. And then he said, imagine breathing in the higher active elements contained within the air. Breathing in these higher elements and then breathing out this gray, foggy waste. Aware that as we breathe in, we are feeding ourselves. And as we breathe out, we are cleansing and detoxifying ourselves. Now, in In Search of the Miraculous, uh, when Mr. Gurdjieff was talking about breathing, 
to uh, Uspensky. He said that, you know, imagine that there are 20 things in the air. A normal man breathes in the air, and then he breathes out 10 of those particles. I'm not quoting it, it exactly. And so he retains 10 particles, breathes out another 10. But he said, as we begin to work on ourselves, as we begin to grow our being, and as we consciously breathe, we actually retain more of the higher elements contained in the air. So two men can breathe in the same air, and one breathe back out 10 elements, and the other breathe back out five elements. And so this ability to retain these elements that are actually higher substances that we need to help us develop and grow ourselves at a higher level are retained within the body. J.G. Bennett said we retain these elements simply through conscious breathing. So just being aware of our breath, being aware of the flow of air, the movement of muscles, our body breathing, bringing this power of attention, this higher energy of attention, of mindful awareness to our body helps us to absorb these higher particles that can then help us to grow our inner being. Mr. Gurdjieff, of course, took it one step further. We're three brained beings. So to breathe in with that conscious awareness within our head brain, so to imagine breathing in particles of light or higher elements or however we want to represent it with our head brain. And our head brain is capable of thinking in words and pictures. And so as a picture, I think a nice one is to imagine breathing in a luminosity. And then, as Mr. Gurdjieff said, breathing out that almost cigarette-like smoke, I prefer to think of it as a gray, foggy waste. This is part of the imaginal, imaginative, pictorial part of our head brain. So just imagining, visualizing this engages the head brain. And then being aware of the sensation of breathing. Being aware of the sensation of air as it flows in through our nose, nasal cavity, back of mouth, throat, past our vocal cords, into our lungs and back out again. Being aware of the sensation of the various muscles involved, our diaphragm, our abdomen, the muscles between our ribs, and being aware of the sensation of our body breathing is to invoke and to use our body brain. And then, with our feeling brain, to become aware of something different, something that's not sensation, a different quality that we breathe in. And this is why I thought, you know, when I finally put all of these things together, the three-fingered exercise was a wonderful exercise as is the, any exercises that deal with the hands, the bones, the fingers in our hands. Because when we feed our body with oxygen, when we feed our body with these higher elements, we are most able to observe this special quality in our extremities, in our hands and in our feet. And I've described this before as an almost atmospheric quality. And this is my own personal interpretation. This is, I can only use my own description of this. It's like an atmospheric quality that flows down the outside of my hand, even though I know it's bloodborne and within my hand. But it's a different. It's different than the sensation of my hand. It's a different quality, and this quality is feeling. And the other thing about this quality of feeling 
is that there's also a very slow pulse, a slow rhythmic movement to it. And this rhythmic movement aligns with our breath. So as we breathe in and out, there is a connection between that and sort of this pulsing of this atmospheric quality down around our hands. And we can also notice it with our feet. But at the beginning, it's easier to perceive with our hands. So as you breathe in and breathe out, try to become aware of this feeling that's different than sensation. This feeling that you can feel in your hands and fingers. Um, it's like a very subtle uh, atmospheric quality. It's like it's a very subtle vibration. It's this very subtle quality of feeling that we feel in our body. So do your best as you breathe in to notice this quality, this feeling, this different perception in your hands and fingers. It almost, like I said, it's got this very slow pulse that is in relation to your breath. So it's not like the heartbeat pulse. You know, 60, 70 times a minute, it's much slower. And it has a different quality than the sensation. Perhaps sense your hands, sense the skin of your hands, sense the bones in your hands, sense the flesh, the muscles, the tendons, the ligaments in your hands. And then again, focus on your breath, focus on your breathing. And become aware of this different quality in your hands as you breathe. And then try your best as you imagine perhaps breathing in particles of light and then breathing out a gray foggy waste. As you sense your body breathing, sensing the flow of air in through your nose, nasal cavity, back of mouth, throat, vocal cords, down into your lungs and back out again. As you sense the movement of the muscles involved in breathing, as you sense your body breathing, become aware of this quality that comes in with the oxygen and that goes down into your solar plexus. The same feeling that we can feel in our hands. Do your best to become aware of it flowing down into your solar plexus. Breathing in the head brain, the sparkling light perhaps, the gray foggy waste, the sensation of your body, and this different quality that arises and flows down to your solar plexus with the in-breath, and then with the out-breath, try to follow this feeling, this different quality, down to your reproductive organs. So breathing in and just feeling this feeling flowing to your solar plexus, and breathing out and feeling it flowing down into your pelvic region, down to your reproductive organs. Try to become aware of feeling. Try to differentiate feeling from sensing. Aware of the intimate connection between feeling and breath. There are three being foods. The food we eat, the air we breathe, and the impressions we receive. The food we eat eventually gets transformed up to what is called Law 24. That's a substance that's produced in the cerebellum, which is responsible for the sensation of self. And it's responsible for the awareness of our physical body in this space. So the food that we eat leads directly to the sensation of self. The air that we breathe 
leads to this awareness of feeling, this different quality. And as we consciously breathe in, as we invoke and use all three of our brains, our head brain, our body brain, and our feeling brain to breathe, we breathe in these higher particles that allow us to develop our inner being and begin to develop at the higher level. Air comes in as Do 192. Then it moves to Re 96. And then it moves to Mi 48, where it gets stopped. And without an additional shock, it can't move. Now, part of this additional shock is being aware of receiving impressions through our head brain that provides an additional shock. But another way of doing it is through breathing, because when we consciously breathe, we are actually breathing in particles of so 12 on the octave of air, which then can combine with the me 48 of the octave of air and lead to a more mindful awareness of our feelings. That mindful awareness of that flow of atmosphere down around the outside of our hands. That mindful awareness of something that flows down, that feeling that flows into our solar plexus. And then as we breathe out, that flows down into our reproductive organs is a uh, do re mi, it's fa 24 of the octave of air. So becoming aware of our body, becoming aware of our breathing. And then just allow this exercise to, 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 to end. And this is something you should try to work on. Try to become aware of the difference between sensation and feeling. It's a very important thing to begin to distinguish between the awareness of feeling and the awareness of sensing. Now become aware of the atmosphere around you and this atmosphere can be dispersed. Most people live in a state of dispersal where their atmosphere is not contained. It's this television show or thinking about that person or whatever. Um, it's always just dispersed and pulled away. You know, like a factory producing smoke in a high wind and all the smoke is just dispersed. But we have the ability to collect our atmosphere, to develop a collected state. So collect your atmosphere around you. Become aware of its border. Become aware of where it ends. Try to keep it around a meter, meter and a half in length. So, you know, between the meters, 39 inches, um, for those of us who still think in metric. So 39, so let's say 40 to 60 inches. 60 inches is five feet. So somewhere between three and a half and five feet, a meter, meter and a half around us. And recognize that we disturb our atmosphere through our thoughts, through our sensations, through our feelings. So keep your thoughts quiet, keep your sensations quiet, keep your feelings quiet, and just keep this atmosphere tranquil, calm around yourself. And this is what we should do every time we finish an inner exercise, because some of the elements that we have worked on during the inner exercise are contained within this atmosphere. So keep it calm, keep it tranquil, keep it still. And I'm only, I only say these numbers and everything so we can all do it together. Um, there's no purpose or reason behind the numbers. It just makes it easier as a group work. But I'm going to count from one up to three. And when I get to three, let's all just breathe our atmosphere in. And then as we breathe out, Imagine in whatever way you can that you retain something from your atmosphere. You could even become aware, feel of the feeling of what we retain and become aware of it flowing into your solar plexus and then further down. 
So one, two, three. Breathe in the atmosphere, and as you breathe out, imagine a part of it is retained. And then let's just finish by silently in your mind repeating the words may results from this exercise be transubstantiated within me for my being. And then um, let us all uh, come back to this, uh, to here and now. And last week, one of the things I asked uh, everyone to try to do um, was to focus on our eyes, ears, nose, and taste buds. Focus on the receiving of an impression. So to be aware of the eyes receiving an impression. To be aware of the ears receiving sound. To be aware of our nostrils perceiving taste or smell. And our taste buds, aware of our taste buds tasting. And so I, I challenged uh, those of you who were here last week to try to do this and to bring back any observations about this. Does anyone have any observations about looking, listening, smelling, and tasting? Um, Mr. Gurdjieff said that this was the beginning of the first conscious shock, to be aware of our eyes, ears, nose, and taste buds receiving impressions he actually said we double the impression which is a very sly way of saying that when we become mindful we're stepping up to a different level and each level is twice as vibrant twice as intelligent uh twice as or half as dense uh, and under half the constraints under half the laws is the level below so in effect it is a doubling um, stepping up to this level. But any observations? Anyone? Did anyone try this? Anyone have any comments they, they could make about this? Ian? Um, so I noticed I had, I had a few moments where I could tune into the audio cues, uh, the, you know, the hearing coming in. And then as I would bring in the visual, it, the audio is just kind of the easiest for me because it, it's very, I don't know, it's easier for me to hear multiple sounds and get kind of a three-dimensional effect of them. And then when I would bring in the visual, I, I would get sort of these brief flashes of a sense of the, like the two combining, like it would create the sense of space around me and then I would lose it. Yeah. Um, and then, it, you know, I think that happened maybe two, three, maybe four times this week. Yeah. Um, I had more trouble with the the smell and the taste. Uh, I I would often lose the other two when I would go into those. Um, mm. They felt more internal, um, and not so much you know, attuned with you know the, the space around me. So I had a, I had a harder time kind of holding yeah. the hearing and the visual along with the sense sense and the taste, um, but. It's it's interesting to see how difficult it is to maintain yeah. those. Yeah. Um, I find it the easiest with my sense of hearing as well. Um, to be aware of my ears hearing uh, is, and it's the hardest for me to be aware of my eyes looking. Um, I can be very mindful of what I see, but to bring that mindful awareness back to my eyes seeing, to be aware of my eyes as an organ of perception, as an organ of visual perception. It, it, take, it requires that extra step, but hearing is the easiest. Um, they say that hearing is the last sense to go. So people who could be comatose in a hospital room, um, the last thing they, they lose is hearing and, and that awareness of hearing. Um, Do you sleep okay? Uh, oops. 
I'm just muting you, Karen, because we're hearing that. Um, any other comments um, from just doing that? Um, things that we can uh, share about the receiving of light through our eyes, and not just our eyes, because last week I said it's very important to become aware of what's going on in the peripheral. I mean, right now, my dog is at the window, and I'm aware of him looking around, and um, we can spot movement more in the peripheral of our vision, uh, the peripheral of our hearing. You know, we can hear sounds at the periphery to be aware of what's at the peripheral of our smell, even the peripheral of our taste. Quite often, our taste and our smell are peripheral senses. We're not really aware of them. They're just at the edges of our awareness. And, you know, we're doing it at a very mechanical level. And to bring this into conscious awareness um, is good. Um, at any rate, just try to work on that. Try to develop that more. Try to become aware of breathing. Try to become aware of the difference between feeling and sensation. And then um, I did talk a bit about uh, esoteric psychology last week. I began to introduce it. Is there, are, are there any comments or any questions from what we talked about last week? There is so much information that can be unpacked from the diagram of all living things. Uh, it's incredible how much information is contained within that small chart that uh, uh, can help us to understand ourselves, help us to understand the universe, help us to understand the various laws of the universe. I've only begun to scrape the surface uh, uh, last week. And, uh, you know, I intend to go a bit deeper today. But, um, Ahmed. I have a question. I can sure. Have a, yeah. Um, in the uh, in the chart uh, that you showed us yesterday, uh, last week, yeah, uh, the first two squares, which is the, the absolute and the the yeah the eternal, uh, unchanging, eternal yeah. unchanging, uh, these are the only two squares that has only two numbers: one six yeah. three twelve. Uh, um, that's, can you, you explain know, this? Yeah, yeah, because you know the. I mean, I'll, I'll be explaining this slightly today. Um, now, what we, we, what, what we don't also realize is that at the very bottom, um, there are also only two elements. Um, I think Mr. Gurdjieff said it was, you know, the, the, the holy denying without a holy, um, holy affirming. Uh, that it's just at the beginning, I mean, to understand the diagram. Um, and this is always something I was going to talk about today. Um, we can see it more readily apparent in the first, in the middle, in the ray of creation. One, three, six, twelve, twenty-four, forty-eight, ninety-six. Um, of these numbers, twelve, twenty-four, forty-eight, ninety-six are the most important numbers in relation to ourselves as human beings. But the numbers all have meaning. These are not random numbers. Uh, this is why I think, you know, I, I don't like the way J.G. Bennett took it an extra step uh, with his mind because he would talk about energy one, uh, energy two, energy three, energy four, energy five. And, you know, energy three is really hydrogen six. And by saying three, you miss an important shade of what six means, what 12 means, what 24 means. So he wanted to do it, you know, rather than, you know, one, three, six, 12, 24, it'd be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven for the internal diagram. But... Mr. Gurdjieff, in his Search of the Miraculous, says to Uspensky, in the beginning was the one. In the beginning was the absolute unity. God, the one, where there was no distinction, no difference. And he said uh, one of the big problems is how did the one become the many? And <laughs> He also, at, uh, in some other place, said that, you know, each of these numbers represents laws. 
and the absolute number one is under law but it's the law of unity and the law of unity is represented by the one now Mr. Gurdjieff didn't fully explain this. Um, I understand this through uh, my exploration of uh, a fourth way philosopher who was a Hindu called Sri Aurobindo, and through the common ancient philosophy that underlies all of Hinduism, which is called Shamkhya Yoga. And they say that in the absolute, I mean, the universe can exist in an unmanifested state and then when the universe begins to manifest in other words the process of creation moving from that unitive oneness the first step is into three so and uh, within the chankhya yoga within that branch they say that the three is co equal in a sense the three is co-eternal but when the universe is unmanifest the three are in a state of absolute equilibrium and so the three is contained in potential within the one and the first step of creation the first step down into the ray of creation is from the one to the three. In the Gurdjieffian system, we can talk about the holy affirming, holy denying, holy reconciling. Uh, Hinduism, at its origins, and there are still elements within it, and it's still an understanding, but I believe it's gotten distorted, also recognize the law of three. Because they say everything is a manifestation of the three gunas, the three essential modes of nature, or three essential modes of energy, which they call sattva, tamas, and rajas. And I'm using those phrases, the Sanskrit phrases, to align with holy affirming, holy denying, holy reconciling, because within Hinduism, they usually go sattva, rajas, and tamas. They usually do from the order of the highest to the lowest. So within the, the one is the unitive, indivisible reality. Um, the Hindus have another phrase that I love. They say that this level of reality, even though I'm talking about it, even though I'm expressing it in abstract terms, is beyond words it's beyond any ability of mine to try to define it they say it is five fingers more than anything we can imagine so how did this unitive oneness then become the world and here two concepts or one concept is important the concept of involution so as the involution as opposed to evolution, um, life is an evolutionary mechanism. It evolves back upwards. But at the origin, with the ray of creation, uh, uh, the ray of creation moves downwards, and it's an involution from the absolute down. Uh, it's very interesting how Mr. Gurdjieff calls all of these different energies Hydrogen one, hydrogen three, hydrogen six, and so on. Because in the first moment after the Big Bang, when the entire universe was contained in a size of about the head of a pin, apparently there was only hydrogen. Hydrogen was the first element that manifests. And then as the universe cooled, as it got denser, as it moved outwards the other elements appeared and so we can look at one as the absolute as the indivisible unity and then the first step downwards is into hydrogen three which in the ray of creation is defined as all worlds also in the system it's defined as the holy reconciling so number one is the holy affirming three is the holy reconciling 
Four is the holy denying. So the one, three, and six represent, so to speak, the Godhead. So when we look up at the starry realm, you know, all suns, that starry realm really has a heavenly quality about it. There's a level of divinity to the entire starry realm as a whole that there isn't when it steps down to the level of our sun. So in the beginning was the one and inherent within the one in an unmanifest form was the three. And the first step down within the ray of creation was to bring the three out. But the three itself doesn't contain, and it's not the divine blueprint of the law of three, because the law of three requires these energies to be in very specific relationships to each other. So the one has to meet or blend with the six in order to create the three. So at the highest levels, you know, within the one, within the absolute, we can't really talk about the three. So it's not represented uh, that way. In the top uh, rectangle, we can see the one and the six. So the one must blend with the six to become the three. And this is the primary um, law of three, the primary blueprint for all other expressions of the law of three. We are ourselves an expression of the law of three. In world 48, that is in the earthly plane, we have a head brain, a body brain, and a feeling brain. Our head brain is a manifestation of the affirming, our body brain of the denying, and our feeling brain of the reconciling. And this is a bit of work that J.G. Bennett did. So he said at the level of world 48, we have three brains. At the level of world 24, we have three centers. We have the intellectual center, the physical center, and the emotional center. At the level of the real I, at the level of world 12. And he's using Mr. Gurdjieff's words here. If you read in tales, Mr. Gurdjieff will often refer to spiritualized parts. And here again, the spiritualized parts. We have a, 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 an intellectual affirming spiritualized part. We have a more physical denying spiritualized part. And we have a more emotional, reconciling, spiritualized parts. So that ourselves in world 48, let me just uh, bring this up. So our, ourselves up in world 48, we talk about our three brains. In world 24, we talk about our three centers. And within world 12, we talk about our three spiritualized parts. Now, I'm going to just take that away. What we have to understand is the movement from the absolute down, and it goes beyond the moon. It goes way, way down into in the inconscient matter, into dead, heavy matter. But within the densest, heaviest matter, Hydrogen 1 still exists, as does hydrogen 3, as does hydrogen 6, as does hydrogen 12. They are all present, but they're hidden. Even around us in the air is hydrogen 1, hydrogen 3, hydrogen 6. We just lack the ability to perceive it, uh, to connect with it. So this is a diagram, in a sense, of the movement of the ray of creation downwards. Each level is twice as dense 
half as vibrant, half as intelligence, intelligent. Each level down is subject to twice the constraints. And so at the level of the absolute, at the level of that undifferentiated oneness, the law that rules that oneness is the law of unity. The first step down is in to the law of three. But the law of three to be fully expressed requires one, six, and three. So that is the holy affirming. And then if we go with three, the holy reconciling, and six, the holy denying. So here, absolute is a good term. The eternal unchanging. We can call this the holy reconciling. The level of archangels, we can also call this the holy denying. So these three realms, there's an element of divinity. These are the realms of the Godhead, the heavenly realm. Uh, let me just get rid of those. So there's this, you know, becoming more dense, becoming more stupid, becoming more rigid, coming under more and more laws in a very in a very systematic fashion is what happens so the first step down is from one law to three laws and then all subsequent laws involve a doubling or a halving so as we move down the intelligence is divided by half as we move down, the vibration is, uh, it, it, it becomes more dense. It's less vibrant. It's less aware. It's less conscious. And the other thing is these are all different levels of consciousness. Um, so when uh, Jalaluddin Rumi, um, I'm just, uh, whoops, I'm going to try and I can't move something um uh jalaluddin rumi um i've got it quoted just give me a second i probably can't find it that easily sorry um he said something like i slept in the minerals um i'm okay my screen is going weird i'm gonna have to stop sharing this um i slept as the minerals I slumbered in the plants. I awoke in man. Um, he's talking about consciousness, awareness. So at these different levels, um, let me try and bring this up again. Uh, and, or let me try and I can find the quote. Um, so the Sufi poet, Jalaluddin Rumi, said, I died as a mineral and became a plant. I died as a plant and rose to an animal. I died as an animal and I was a man. And in a sense, he's referring to the same truth, how we move up, except there's a mistake in the way he did it. He poetically represented it. We do not leave behind the metallic realm as we evolve up into the mineral realm. It's like the mineral realm is built on the metallic realm. And then as we move up to the realm of the plants, this is built on both the mineral and metallic realm. As we move up to the realm of invertebrates, this is built on the plants, the minerals, and the metals. As we move up to the lowest level of man, the level of invert vertebrates, the level of slumbering man, we do not get rid of our invertebral self. We do not get rid of our plant self. We do not get rid of our mineral self. It's like an apartment building where we build successive floors on it. J.G. Bennett, in one of his relaxation exercises, 
talked about how important it was to relax the large and small intestines. He said that this was the seat of our vegetative self. So the food that comes into our mouth, then goes into our stomach, then goes into our duodenum, where it reaches the note me and it requires an outside shock to begin continuing developing and that's when air comes in and air meets food between our duodenum and our liver. But this accounts for the higher part of our digestive process up from our liver. There is still a lower part of the digestion taking place. And this is within our intestines. This is where we still in a very real way have an animal, or not an animal self, a plant self. Uh, we know through the study of human embryology, the development of the fertilized egg through the embryo, through the fetus to the baby, that the embryo goes through all sorts of stages of evolution, you know, from fish to seeing gills, to the gills mm -hmm. disappearing, to various different things coming out. And it's not that they disappear. Nature doesn't work that way. We may build a mud hut and then knock that mud hut down and build a wooden structure and knock that wooden structure down and then build a brick house. Within nature, the earlier structures are not knocked down. So it would be the mud hut and then a wooden house built on top of the mud hut and then the brick structure built on top of the wooden structure on top of the mud hut. So for instance, in our brain stem, uh, we still have a reptilian self. It's not that we have evolved and we are separate from the reptiles. There is an actual reptilian self that still exists within ourselves. We have the structures in the brain stem. Uh, this part of ourself is the more primitive part of our mind. It's more concerned with fear, safety, survival. Uh, in uh, uh, times of crisis, in times of conflict, in times of warfare, in times of uh, you know upheaval, violence and things, this self can take over. Uh, you know, we can react in a very primitive way, fight, flight, or survive. It's not that as we develop at the higher levels, these structures are no longer within us. They're all within us. So to begin to understand humans, and this is what I said last week about how Mr. Gurdjieff said that it is impossible to study psychology without studying cosmology, without studying all of this. Now, the interesting thing is that there is this movement, there is this involution of the universe as it steps down level by level by level, getting more and more dense, getting stupider, um, so that the higher particles are still there, but they are so embedded in matter as to be non-existent. Um, within the uh, Hindu tradition, they say consciousness has fallen into a swoon. It's gone asleep, but it still exists in the rock. Within the rock is <clears throat> consciousness, but it is asleep. And it's a matter of awakening consciousness. And each of these levels, also represents a level of consciousness. So studying cosmology, studying the ray of creation, studying all of this really is important in terms of understanding ourselves. Now, one of the most important truths that is contained in these diagrams is the purpose of life. Mr. Gurdjieff said from a very early age, he was, he, he, he was driven 
to find, and this is the, I'm using an exact phrase, the purpose and significance of organic life on planet Earth. And this diagram shows the purpose and significance of organic life on planet Earth. Um, a metaphor that I came up with years ago. A man walks along, or a man, you know, walks to the sea and he comes upon a beach of golden sand and he smiles and he reaches into his backpack and he takes out a pan and he steps into the water and he fills water in the pan and then he puts some of the golden sand into the pan and then he uses water and gravity to separate the gold from the sand. This is the most primitive and most basic form of mining. My dad was a geologist. He had a PhD in geochemistry. He was very involved in the mining industry. You have a rock of ore and you pulverize that rock. And there are bits of gold contained in that rock and ways to separate the gold from the rock. So it's this process. This is what is ruled by the law of three. The higher blends with the lower to meet in the middle. And in the analogy I use, the man was the higher, the golden sand was the lower, and the man blended, and the energy of the man blended with the golden sand to produce the gold. Now here it's also important to recognize that not only was the gold produced, but so was the sand. Um, you know, you've heard some people say that not only must we grow in our understanding and must we learn things, but we must unlearn things as well. And as we learn new things, we unlearn old things. So the refined is separated from the coarse. We eat an apple. There are elements within our digestive process. Apple comes in as hydrogen 768. Um, it's represented down at the level of metals here. This is found in the food diagram, and it meets with hydrogen 192, which is a higher element that's already present in our body, and the higher blends with the lower to refine hydrogen 384. But not only is hydrogen 384 refined up, but hydrogen 3072 is refined down. So when we eat the apple, elements of the apple are refined up within ourselves and become our being and feed our being and whatever it happens. And part of the apple is refined downwards. And it eventually, we flush it down the toilet. Um, so Mr. Gurdjieff said that our purpose, and this is the purpose we share with all organic life on Earth, and this is the phrase he used in Beelzebub Tales, is that we are cosmic apparatuses designed for the transformation of energies. And the way energy is transformed is through this process of refining. The higher blends with the lower to meet in the middle. And science and biologists and people involved in nutrition talk about the circle of life. And I remember as a child, the posters of life and the circle of life, and they turned it into a circle. And this is sort of uh, hinted at in Lion's King and the song, The Circle of Life but it's not so much a circle as it is a stairway. There's actually a thrust. There's an underlying purpose behind organic life. And the ray of creation is the involution of the one down through all of these levels 
getting heavier and more denser and moving downwards. Whereas the evolution of life is a movement back up. So involution is downwards and evolution is upwards. And evolution is true. Biologists have begun to understand the process of evolution, but they are wrong when they say that the impetus behind evolution is the selfish gene. Genetics, DNA, our genes are just the best way that nature has developed to serve this evolutionary function. And the real impetus behind evolution is food. And there was an ancient phrase, I eat so I can be eaten. And there is this movement upwards and downwards, refining and coarsening, coarsening that happens with life. And on this planet, it only happens with the development of life. And scientists know that, you know, if something grows too abundant, another species will evolve to feed on that abundance. And I have to say, I'm very concerned with global warming in terms of the lives that will be lost, in terms of the areas of the earth that can turn into deserts. But I'm not that concerned with it because by releasing all that carbon into the atmosphere, and we are carbon-based life forms, life will evolve to feed on it. However, as human beings, you know, we, I don't know how many nuclear reactors we have in the world, how many huge bats of terrible chemicals and things we have in the world. Um, just recently in the last few days, um, a dam broke in a uh, mine in Brazil and the sludge. Uh, so, you know, when they separated the higher, whatever it was that they wanted to separate out, they separated the lower and they did it through a very obnoxious chemical way. And so they keep that as sludge and a dam broke and it, uh, the water spread out and down into a uh, village. And I believe as of today, over 40 people have died from that. I'm much more concerned with the toxins that we've produced, with the potential for Fukushima's and nuclear radiation, because the carbon will be eaten. Plants eat carbon. We eat carbon. Um, it has been estimated that if we didn't lose any skin cells, and right now we're losing skin cells, they're flaking off, they're becoming food for dust mites, and then the dust mites become food for other creatures. But it has been estimated that if we never flaked off a skin cell, if we never breathed out the carbon dioxide, if we never sweated if we never went to the toilet, by the end of our life, and this is a normal life of about 75 years, we would actually weigh 55,000 tons. We would be these immense blobs. So just by living, by eating, we are transforming energies upwards and we are transforming energies downwards. So my excrement become my excrement is dinner for a lot of animals. And this is one of the, you know, where Mr. Gurdjieff's an amazing man, Beelzebub. Beelzebub was supposed to be the lord of the dung flies. And the dung flies, and excuse my language, take shit and transform it into something higher. And, you know, Mr. Gurdjieff said that we are married, and he used that word in French a lot for his students. And, you know, when you think of, you know, the subtlety behind, you know, naming the protagonist of his novel with that name, the Lord of the Dung Flies, um, that transform crap into something higher. So the purpose of life is to transform energy. It's to take the lower substances and lift them up. And so we can talk more about a stairway to heaven 
and I don't know what the corners and why this diagram came to us with this way. Hopefully the intuition and the insight will come. But if we look at this diagram and life starts with the metals, the minerals, the plants, the invertebrates, man, we can realize that organic life on planet Earth is moving back up the ray of creation. It's evolving upwards to the ray of creation. And we can step back and look at all organic life on planet Earth. So right from the metals, and on the right-hand side, on the diagram over here, I've made some changes to make this more understandable. Um, this is the level of most of humanity, slumbering man. Uh, this is associated with the, I mean, Mr. Gurdjieff said that there were four states of consciousness, sleep, and then the waking state, um, we can use the phrase waking sleep or the slumbering state where people live in that state of sleep. The next level up, he called personally conscious. Um, it's the, the world 24. We can also use the word mindful. Um, so that's why I use the term mindful man. But this is where we should be centered. This is where humanity should be centered, but we've degenerated. And then at the, the higher level, awake man. And awake man, hydrogen 12, he actually has his higher story is six, his lower story is 24. So he connects with the realm of the Godhead. And when we understand this, so metals, minerals, plants, vertebrates, up to slumbering man, to mindful man. And, and here, St. Paul in the New Testament in the Bible called the level of man at this level carnal man. He called the mindful man this level natural man. And then he called this level the awake man spiritualized man. We can see that there is this thrust of evolution, so to speak, connecting heaven and earth, connecting the most refined with the most coarsened. So there is this thrust that underlies evolution. It's not a circle. It's a movement upwards. And the movement upwards was defined by the movement downwards. So by the ray of creation moving down shows us the path to move back up. And then if we come over, I mean, there's so much more I'm going to be saying over the next few weeks. But if we come back to the right side diagram and think of slumbering man in the state of waking sleep, <clears throat> mindful man in the state of personal consciousness, awakened man, Mr. Gurdjieff used the word objective consciousness to describe this state, we can begin to see the journey that we ourselves have to make. Um, I'm just going to end with the concept that, you know, in St. Paul, and this is something Mr. Gurdjieff said as well, this level being centered in world 24 should be our rightful state as human beings. And instead, there's been a degeneration, a movement downwards. And this is something Mr. Gurdjieff talks about in Beelzebub Tales. As we disrupt life on planet Earth, as we make species go extinct, members of our species will be born at a lower level in order to transform that energy so there are no gaps. So this is quite horrific when we think about it. You know, there were 30 million bison, buffalo in the central plains of America, <laughs> And they were wiped out to wipe the Indians out, to de deprive the Indians of their food source. Mm -hmm. And more and more humans become herd-like animals following the herd. So the step up 
to the mindful state, the step up to personal consciousness, is really rising back up. It's like there has been a fall. You know, they talk about in the Bible, the fall of man. There has been this degeneration. And we're supposed to step up to the mindful state. Now, you can imagine some primitive tribesmen in the middle of the jungle in Borneo or the middle of the Amazonian rainforest. And we have to ask ourselves, are they really that primitive? You live in such an environment and you go out for a walk through the forest. And if you think about what Joe said to Mary last night around the campfire and how did could Peter say this to you? And if you think about that television show or the book you read, you become food. If you get too hypnotized and entranced by the words and picture maker, that is the dominant aspect of most people on this planet. You would not survive. You have to be walking looking for the slight movement of perhaps a poisonous snake or being aware of the insects that want to eat you or the jaguars or whatever. You walk there with that mindful awareness of yourself as food and, you know, things that can come onto your skin like insects and whatever while being very aware of your environment. This is the definition of basic self-remembering. The awareness of myself here in this environment. And so in a sense, these so-called primitive people are actually higher and of a higher level of being than civilized man. Civilized man, we walk down the sidewalk with our headphones on and we're not paying attention and we look at the, the lights, it's green, we can go, it's red, we don't. And, we're not really aware like we would be if we were back in our natural environment, being a predator and being prey for other predators and having to watch for all sorts of different things around us. So that's our natural state. So the beginning of the Gurdjieff teachings is really just a movement up into that state into that awareness, into being perceptive of myself, my physical body here in this environment. I mean, the environment I'm sitting in right now is really safe. I've got a cat and a dog. There are no poisonous insects here. Actually, this is one of the great things about Canada and cold because we don't have venomous snakes. We don't have a lot of poisonous insects or anything like that because winter kills them. So there's a, a less of a concern here than there is at the equator in terms of poisonous things like scorpions and poisonous snakes. And um, so I live in a very neutralized environment. Um, where I live right now, 200 years ago, there was a big problem with malaria because there were swamps and stuff like that. And they drained them all. You know, they put concrete at the bottom of all these streams. A lot of streams in Toronto, they buried underground. And, and they put big tubes for the water to flow through. So through the taming of our environment, through, you know, air-conditioned cars and air-conditioned houses and central heating and all of that, we've lost a lot. And so the preliminary inner exercises are really designed to just try and help us move up this uh, other level. Um, so I've, I've run out of time. I, you know, I got a little talking a little too much, giving you a lot of information. Um, I'm going to continue with this. I'm getting more and more specific with esoteric psychology, the understanding of cosmology, understanding where we fit into it. As I said, the three most important levels are slumbering man, mindful man, and awake man. Of these, the most important one for us to understand is slumbering man. And slumbering man has, you know, we're three-story beings, so they have access to the level immediately above and immediately below. So we've got to ask ourselves, what does it mean? 
to be an invertebrate? What is our invertebral self? Uh, what is our mindful self? What does it mean to be personally conscious? What does it mean to be in the center at that level of vertebrates? To understand ourselves in the cosmological perspective, in the greater scheme, and then begin to look at ourselves in terms of self-study to see how these different things apply to us, to see how we exist on these different levels of existence, and right. to understand what the movement upwards is and how the various inner exercises and techniques and processes that we can engage in help us move up, help us to evolve. And within ancient, um, ancient, within medieval Christianity, you know, they said that you know, man is the link between heaven and earth. And when we look at this diagram, we can see how at the top end of life on planet Earth, humanity indeed, humans, men, individuals, can indeed become those links between heaven and earth. And then this gives us a little key into understanding the ultimate purpose of humanity, what we should be doing ourselves. We should grow our being up to such a level that we can be a conduit for the higher forces to flow down through us into the earth. We don't just awaken just to become awakened beings. As we become awakened beings, we serve a higher function. Um, within Mr. Gurdjieff's uh, five being Apogonian strivings, the fourth is to basically develop ourselves up to that level so that we can lighten some of the sorrow of the divine, of God. And we do that by developing ourselves up to that level and taking a responsibility to bring the higher into the lower. Um, whoops, I'm getting uh, some feedback from, I'm not sure where that's coming from, but it's just as 1201. Um, I don't have time for questions. I'll try to put this up online today. If you want to review it, uh, go back Thank through you. it and we can Thank start you. with okay. questions and everything um, next yes. week. I will stop sharing. Okay. Um, you know, thank you all for being here. Thank uh, you, Alan. And, thank you know, I, I am... This was to, a very different session. <laughs> yeah. Th this is to understand who we are and what we should begin looking for. But at any rate, um, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Um, take care. And uh, you. bye now. Uh, bye. Bye.